What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about the one and only Gigi Allen. The man who is known for beating himself bloody with the microphone, throwing his bodily fluids at the audience at his shows, writing songs like Eat My Diarrhea, and supposedly being arrested over 50 times before his death in 1993. And depending on who you ask, he's either the best thing or the worst thing to ever happen to music. He called himself the last true rock and roll rebel, and to some people, he was that. In an era where punk has been commercialized and watered down to the point where now the Kardashians are making TikToks about emo girls, and the idea of punk being any kind of threat is pretty much long gone, to some people, Gigi Allen represents what punk should be. Terrifying, dangerous, and just completely out of control with no limits. But to other people, he's the exact opposite of what punk should be. A profoundly damaged, dysfunctional abuser who embodied all the violent, self-destructive parts of punk that should have been left in the 70s. So what's the truth? Who was Gigi Allen? And what made him so compelling? Why did everybody from CKY to Faith No More to Nirvana draw influence from him? And what does it say about us that we continue to be so fascinated with Gigi? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. But first, if you haven't, please check me out on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific. And there's a link to that in the description of this video. But first, I want to thank Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. And who are the top three most badass champions in Raid? I would say Hex Weaver, because you got to have a healer in your party, right? And Painkeeper, who pairs really, really well with Maneater. And of course, Sniper because, I don't know, she's a hot goth archer girl. What more do you need to know? And there's a ton happening in Raid this month. Five badass looking new champions, skins for everyone's favorite dwarf, Trunda. Raid is currently running a special Deliana chase event where you can get your hands on the amazing Deliana. All you have to do is log in and play Raid for seven days between now and July 28th, and you will get Deliana for free. That's it. All new players, listen up. Once you're in game, just enter your promo code MYDELIANA to get your hands on everything. Simple. Get 50 XP brews to instantly get your legendary hero Deliana to max level 50. This is the best time to get started in raid. And if you click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion named Virgus, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. And all this treasure will be waiting for you right here. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in the game. I don't remember exactly when I first heard about GG Allen, but it was probably around 91 or 92 in either Thrasher or Maximum Rock and Roll. And I read some story about this guy who would get on stage wearing nothing but cowboy boots and smash himself in the face with a microphone and just like destroy the entire venue and scare the shit out of everybody in the process. And me being like 13 or 14 years old, I was like, holy shit, this sounds amazing. I need to check this guy out. And it was actually really hard to find his music back then, but I got a tape from a friend that had one song of his on it, which was You Hate Me and I Hate You. Well, you hate me and I hate you. You never understand the things I say I do. So what's new? And it was actually not at all what I was expecting. Based on the sort of iconic photos of him with the sunglasses and the hat and everything, where he looked like a cross between a biker and a serial killer, I was expecting something like super dark and heavy, like Flipper or Black Flag or whatever. But this was definitely not that. This was like more like the Ramones, almost like pop punk. So I was a little bit confused, but I was able to track down some of his other stuff that was that sort of like super raw, noisy, dark kind of stuff that I was expecting to hear. And then things started to make a little bit more sense. And shortly after that, I saw the documentary about him called Hated, which really told his whole story. And by the way, just a fun piece of trivia, that movie was directed by Todd Phillips, who went on to be an extremely successful Hollywood director who made movies like Old School, The Hangover, and most recently, The Joker. He had done too much heroin and couldn't go through with the show, but his fans managed to get their money's worth by repeatedly kicking him and breaking bottles over his head. And that's where I learned more about exactly who he was. Gigi Allen was born in 1956, and his real name was Jesus Christ Allen. His father came up with that name because supposedly he saw a vision from Jesus before his son's birth 
which kind of gives you some idea of the really like unstable, scary circumstances that he grew up in. As Gigi himself describes it, the first five years of my life were infested with sickness and violence. It consisted of living in a log cabin in the northern woods of New Hampshire with father, mother, and brother. It was an extremely real, primitive, antisocial existence with no running water, little heat, and unbearably claustrophobic. We boiled, watered, laundered, and bathed in a very tiny chipped sink. And the way that him, his brother, and his mother all describe his dad, it sounds like his dad was a profoundly mentally ill person. To the point where, as Gigi put it, we were more like prisoners than family. To the point where his father eventually held them at gunpoint, saying that he was going to kill the entire family because God told him to. Even going so far as to dig graves for all of them in the basement of the house. His mom was eventually able to get away from their father, and one of the first things that she did was change his legal name to Kevin, but the name Gigi stuck. His brother Merle couldn't say Jesus, so he just said Gigi, and that became Kevin's nickname for the rest of his life. And as you would expect from anybody who grew up like that, he was a very troubled kid. He started doing drugs, getting into fights, breaking into people's houses. He also wore women's clothes to high school, which these days is not super remarkable. But remember, this was back in the 70s when that was extremely controversial and seen as very, very weird. And even though they had escaped from the direct violence of his father, that had clearly left a mark. And here is how he describes his teenage years. Very chaotic, full of chances and dangers. We sold drugs, stole, broke into houses, cars, etc. Did whatever we wanted for the most part, including all the bands we played in. People even hated us back then. And that's where music started to become a bigger part of his life. He got into standard 70s rock stuff like Jimi Hendrix and Aerosmith. And then outlaw country like Hank Williams, and eventually early proto-punk like the New York Dolls and Alice Cooper, then the Ramones, and eventually started his first real band called the Jabbers in 1977, where he played drums and sang, and eventually released his first album with them in 1980 called Always Was, Is, and Always Shall Be, which I personally think is the best stuff he ever did. And it seems like at that time, he was at least somewhat trying to hold it together on a personal and professional level. He had a job, he got married in 1978, and the Jabber's music was actually pretty tame. If anything, it's kind of funny how PG-13 it was compared to the stuff he did years later. But he became increasingly unstable, getting further into drugs and just generally aberrant behavior. And because of that, the band ended up breaking up in 1984. In the following year, in 1985, he became the infamous version of Gigi Allen that most people know of now at a show in Peoria, Illinois, where he pooped on the stage for the first time. For anybody who's not familiar with him, it might sound kind of funny for me to say this, but that actually became like the defining part of Gigi Allen and his stage presence. And this is where it all started. Hundreds of confused punk kids were flipping out, running out the door because the smell was incredible. In fact, I still smell it. Ha ha. Gigi decided to rub shit all over his chest so nobody would try to kick his ass. It was great. And he recorded a ton of music around this time in the mid 80s with a variety of backing bands such as the Scum Fucks, the AIDS Brigade with his brother Merle, and the Cedar Street Sluts among many others. And his music sort of mirrored his behavior, getting increasingly raw and grimy and difficult to listen to compared to the almost upbeat power pop that he was doing with the Jabbers. This era of his music is kind of hit or miss. Some of it is almost unlistenable, but some of it is still pretty good. For example, one of my favorite songs of his, Tough Fucking Shit. This is also when he really started pretty much living on the road, taking his infamous show on the road all over the country. Most of the tours were cut short because Gigi would end up in jail or in the hospital, but word quickly spread through the underground punk scene of how just over the top this guy was. And the really crazy part is that the stories were mostly true. Going to a Gigi Allen show back then was quite literally risking your personal safety. 
And I want to be clear, by this point, what he was doing was way past just like edgy punk rock stuff. This was not funny or cool in any way. It was like legitimately sick, violent behavior. Here's how Fat Mike from No Effects put it, describing a GG show that he went to around this time. And you know that if you've offended Fat Mike, that is an accomplishment. He grabbed this blonde girl from the audience and was just on top of her. She was just screaming. It wasn't fun. It wasn't consensual, but nobody wanted to touch him. Eventually, people were trying to pull him off off her, but you know, there was blood, shit, and glass everywhere. So they finally got him off and then he went around the audience and started hitting people with the base of the mic stand. And that's just one show. There are hundreds of stories like this. You can go see video after video after video. This was a normal, typical Gigi Allen show. And just like his behavior, his music got increasingly unhinged and dark. Like if you listen to some of the recordings from this era around like the late 80s, you can just really hear him losing it on those recordings. And the legend around Gigi Allen continued to grow as he would pop up on local TV news after pretty much every one of his shows. The defense argued Allen was exercising his right of free expression when he defecated on stage and threw feces into the audience. He also promised that he would kill himself on stage on Halloween night, although that never happened, partly because he was in jail the night that it was supposed to happen, partly because I think maybe he changed his mind after he realized that he was getting a lot of attention for this and probably didn't want to cut that short. He was on a tear, but in 1989, he made national news when he was sentenced to prison for cutting and burning a female fan in Michigan. And I'm not going to go into the details here about exactly what happened because it's a little bit too graphic. You can go read about it if you want. The details are all in the news clippings from back then. It's honestly just really sick, disturbing stuff. But by the time he got out in 1991, he was a living legend. On the one hand for, you know, relatively normal suburban punk kids like me, he was just kind of an entertaining spectacle for us to laugh and gawk at. Like, haha, look at the guy smearing poop on himself and hitting himself in the head with a microphone. But for other people, he was an icon. He was the person that they wished they could be. Someone lashing out at the world that had hurt them so badly, just like his father had hurt him, which is how he described his mental state. I had begun hating, not trusting, fighting, and feeling very distant to everyone and everything at a very early age. I observed the world around me as a mere movie, a movie full of culprits and phonies. I was the leading man outside the screen with a hammer, just waiting for my chance to smash it all into oblivion. And within a couple years of getting out of prison, he became somewhat of a household name. You can say what you want about him, but one thing that he understood very well was how to work the media. He became an absolutely relentless self-promoter. He would do interviews with just about anybody, and he even made the rounds on several of the early 90s daytime TV talk shows, where he became very, very good at throwing out shocking sound bites that were the perfect fit for those trashy shows like Donahue and Jerry Springer and all that stuff. I might go out and kick somebody in the head. I might grab a girl and force her to uh, perform moral sex with me. I've had sex on stage with men, women, and animals and everything in between. Oh, okay. actually, I am real. And I, how many of you can, at 35 years old, sleep with 16, 12, 13 year old girls and boys and animals? Hey, this is the life. I got it all. And so in a way he became kind of like the 90s poster child for quote unquote real punk. And although his music was never anywhere close to mainstream, thanks to the reach of those daytime TV talk shows, which got millions and millions of people watching them every day and then were traded on VHS throughout the scene, his persona actually was kind of mainstream. If you were into anything at all related to punk back then, you probably knew who he was. Although I do think it's interesting that I don't know anybody who actually listened to his music back then other than me and a couple of my friends. Because he was really more like a cartoonish version of what punk represented in the eyes of people like Jerry Springer than he was a musician or really an actual member of the punk scene in any way. This is another thing that Fat Mike pointed out, which I think was really smart, is he really sort of existed in his own lane. He didn't tour with other bands. He wasn't really friends with other bands. He wasn't a part of the scene. He was just Gigi. He was sort of an icon of punk, more so than he was an actual part of punk culture, if that makes sense. But then just as his fame was reaching its peak, he suddenly died. 
not from killing himself on stage as he had promised for years, but from an accidental heroin overdose in June of 1993 after a show in New York City. He was buried at a small, unremarkable funeral in a black leather jacket and his trademark jockstrap, but his influence has lived on. As just a couple examples, Faith No More covered him in 1995, and a whole new generation of fans discovered him from the segment of CKY4, where they visit his grave and CKY covers Bite It You Scum. And so he lives on as somewhere between a legend and a human meme. Even 30 years after his death, people are still fascinated by Gigi Allen. And let's talk for a minute about what that means, about why they're so fascinated by him and what that says about us as fans and about the scene in general. The first thing that is just immediately obvious to me now as an adult is that Gigi is what we would call now a trauma survivor. That wasn't a term back in the 80s and 90s. We didn't understand those things as well as we do now. But it is crystal clear to me now that Gigi was who he was because of the horrific abuse that he and his family experienced at the hands of his father. First of all, Merle's father dug like a 10 foot hole in the cellar. And I asked him one day, I said, what are you digging that hole for? And he said, I'm gonna bury you and Merle and Kevin down there. I would really suggest watching the Showtime documentary about him called All in the Family. It has his mom and his brother in it. And they do a really good job of talking about this stuff and kind of humanizing him and showing how so much of who he was was just a response to that childhood trauma and really making you feel a lot of sympathy for him. With that being said, I think it's also very important to remember that he was a violent, abusive person by pretty much all accounts and that none of what he went through as a child excuses anything that he did. We can understand the reasons why, but that doesn't make it okay. And so when I look at the people who are still fascinated by him, I kind of separate them into two categories. The first category is what you might call the casual fans, like me when I was a kid. And for those people, Gigi is really just a spectacle to like gawk and laugh at. And to those people, I would say, I get it. It's entertaining. We all love watching a train wreck, but isn't it a little bit gross and exploitative to use somebody like that for your entertainment? When you see somebody like this, who is clearly just so profoundly dysfunctional? Shouldn't we try to help people like him rather than just fan the flames of their self-destruction? Like, shouldn't we be better than those gross Jerry Springer producers? And the other category is what you could call the hardcore fans. The kind of people who visit his grave and maybe see him as more of like an icon or a hero. And I think for these people, that's oftentimes because they went through a lot of the same traumatic things that he did and they identify with him. They see him as kind of aspirational. Like they wish that they they could tell the world to fuck off just like Gigi did. And to those people, I would say, first of all, I'm sorry that you went through that, but this guy was not a misunderstood genius and idolizing him is not gonna help you. He wasn't saving rock and roll and he wasn't really even a real part of the punk scene. He was just a very damaged, violent guy with limited musical talent who was just willing to do more deranged things than anybody else. Rather than looking to Gigi for inspiration and answers, I would suggest maybe getting some therapy. And so when it comes to Gigi, more than anything else, I see him as tragic. When I was 14, he was sort of an entertaining spectacle, but to me as an adult, it's really just kind of sad. And it's even more sad that there's people who see him as some sort of a legend or a hero. But to quote Fat Mike once again, that was Gigi Allen though. He lowered the bar for everyone. We're gonna kill ourselves on stage like Gigi Allen. Oh, but I miss Gigi. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I wanna thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. I am sincerely grateful for your support. Patrons get access to all my podcasts a week early. I do giveaways, I do some other stuff. There's also a way to have me review your music, artwork, or anything else that you would like to get my eyes and ears on. Every month I do a call for submission. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post, then I will review it live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.